so much uh, for this night, Lord, that we could gather together uh, and we're not outside, we're not freezing, and not in our cars, and uh, we can come together. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to encourage our hearts, Lord, as we go through your word. Um, steady our hearts, Lord, uh, those who are um, weary, those that are sick. Uh, be with my household, Lord, and continue to bring uh, just that quick healing, Lord, that recovery. And uh, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're able to do above and beyond uh, more than we can ask or think. And uh, we pray tonight that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and uh, Lord, that we would be instructed by you and uh, even hear that still small voice in our hearts, Lord, to just be ministered to by you, Lord, knowing that uh, that relationship, Lord, how beautiful that is, that we're not coming together uh, for a religious thing, Lord, and just to do our traditional thing. Uh, but Lord, we just want to grow in you. We want to be in you, Lord, and we want to be led by you. And, and so we just thank you, Lord, that um, uh, we just we want it to be personal, Lord. We don't want it to be all the other stuff. And so we love you, Father. We thank you again uh, for the work that you're doing here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Exodus chapter 11. Uh, so far, we have been dealing with the plagues of Egypt <clears throat> and how God has delivered um, all these plagues to, uh, what is it, nine plagues to Egypt there. And it's just been, it's just been harsh. And so we also saw, saw how God has demonstrated his, his power and his authority um, in these plagues, not just over the natural realm, uh, but also uh, over these false gods as well that the Egyptians have. And, and as we come to chapter 11 and chapter 12 today, we're going to see that God, he's not done with Pharaoh. I, I think if I was in charge, uh, Pharaoh would have been out of the picture a long time ago. <laughs> Just thank the Lord that, again, we see the Lord's long suffering uh, there, which is beautiful. Uh, but we see that God bringing this tenth and final plague upon Egypt, and that, of course, is the death of the firstborn. So we're going to see four things, if you're taking notes, about this tenth plague uh, that is brought by the Lord. And the, the first plague uh, is, or the first thing, I'm sorry, is the, the plundering of the people of Egypt. The plundering of the people of Egypt, in verses 1 to 3. It says in verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from there, from here. And when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. So finally, God tells Moses, this is it, Moses. Hey, this is the last plague that I'm going to send. And it's interesting since when God called Moses uh, and told him uh, that he would send, you know, these plagues, he never told Moses how many plagues there was going to be. Did you guys note that? Um, and, and so finally, after all of the destruction and all of this despair, if you will, uh, this would be the last one. And, and that is, that's so like God. He says, go, uh, but rarely does he say when, right? <laughs> Uh, or where, you know, and, and uh, he says do, but but what, right? We, we always want those details. We want that straight line. We want the plan A to plan B. And um, if, if you're like me, it's like, Lord, uh, we kind of need a place here. <laughs> Could you just show it to us? And, and it's like, and then I'm always reminded in my mind, my heart is, is uh, you know, where's the faith in that? Well, you know, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, Moses, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, he's there in the hall of faith. He's a man of faith. He had a he had a walk by faith as well. Even though the Lord's still instructing him, he had to be instructed by faith as well. Just trust in the Lord. And, um, and I think that's a blessing right there. And you guys get to be a part of that blessing. It's pretty cool. So, um, it's that one step at a time kind of a thing. Look at verse 2. It says, Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask from his neighbor, and every woman from his na her neighbor, 
articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So we're going to see the, the plundering of the Egyptians here. Uh, don't try doing this with your neighbor because it's probably not going to work out so good. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to see in chapter 12 that whatever the Hebrews um, uh, wanted, the Egyptians gave it to them. And, and so in a sense, we can really see that you know, the, the Hebrews are getting back what they deserved in a sense. Because remember, 430 years They've been in slavery, if you will, um, and and uh, wrongfully in, in that sense. So they're getting back, in a sense, their earnings, um, kind of. Look at verse 3. It says, Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And so Moses becomes great over all of Egypt, over all the people. And that blessed my heart. If you guys remember... This is Moses we're talking about, right? Moses, slow to speech, right? Um, and it was reluctant to do what the Lord had called him to do. There was almost like an argument going on there. And he didn't want to go, but he ended up going. And the Lord blessed that. But Moses had, he had nothing to offer, right? In and of himself. And um, he, yet he was still used by the Lord mightily. And uh, that that encourages me. God, God's not looking for our ability he's looking for our availability uh, for those who would say lord here i am send me right like in isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 uh the passage here i think um where god says who who, who can i send who will go for me you know and he says i'll, I'll go right that's always my encouragement i i want to be that guy where god never says who has the requirements right if you if you guys have uh uh, in the last couple of months, I was looking for different jobs and doing all kinds of different resumes and I don't know how many applications, uh, but there's all those, re there's the jobs that you want and then it's like requirement, Woof, all this like list of stuff and it's like, oh man, I'm glad the Lord doesn't do that to us where it's like, you need to reach this, you know, achievement and that achievement and that status and that, the, you know, it's like the Lord just says, come, whoever wants to come, come on. And I'll use you. I'll choose you. Uh, but you can choose to be chosen. Isn't that cool? Um, so it's pretty, pretty neat. So when we come to that place in our hearts and we tell God that, you know, we have nothing, um, he's willing to use us. And it's a beautiful place to be in. Uh, so let's go to the second thing here is the, the plague that will come upon Egypt. This is going to be in verses 4 through 10. Uh, this is the 10th and final plague that we're going to see. Look at verse 4, it says, Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So again, we see a clear distinction between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. And the Israelites were to be different. They were to be set apart, uh, holy unto the Lord. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we're to be like the Israelites, uh, as the church, we're to be different. We're to be set apart. We're to be, um, you know, we're called to a higher standard. It's so high, it's perfection. <laughs> That's the, but we can't do it without Christ, right? And so if we're in him, he's giving us the grace and everything that we need uh, to do what he's called us to accomplish. He guides us and he, he provides for us. But note in verse 7, the byproduct of this difference here, uh, because the children of Israel, they worship the living God. God not even, um, he, uh, 
not even a dog would come and bark at you. Isn't that cool? Uh, to the children of Israel, they would be barking at, you know, an Egyptian, and they see an Israeli, and they're like, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> it's almost like there was a fear there put in their hearts. Uh, but the Israelites, you know, they, they, they have... Um, they had a peace, and that was from the Lord. The Lord was doing so much more beyond just the physical. Uh, there was also the spiritual realm, the animal kingdom as well. But when we're, we're set apart from the world, <clears throat> uh, there will be devastations. There's going to be death. There's going to be a lot of, you know, going on, and we're still going to have that peace in our hearts, though, because, well, Jesus is our peace, right? As, as Christians today, as believers, uh, Jesus said in John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. Uh, Jesus said in Ephesians 2, 14, uh, he says, For he himself is our peace. And so um, that, that, that's just amazing to me. Uh, in verse 8, <clears throat> let's keep going. It says, In all of these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. After that I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all the, these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. So the nine previous plagues uh, did not move Pharaoh. Uh, but this tenth plague, finally, you know, this is, we finally get to the one that will actually move Pharaoh. And, uh, you know, the, all the nine previous ones were, were designed to reveal to Pharaoh that the Lord, he's, he's God, right? It's, he's God alone. He is the Lord and that's what he was showing and teaching Pharaoh, not only Pharaoh, but all of Egypt, that the Lord is God. Uh, remember, they, they served all these other gods, and so God is the Almighty. In other words, the top, you know, one of all. So uh, what, what, think about it. What, what prevented Pharaoh from this realization? It was pride, right? He had so much pride in his heart, he, he kept... Um, Pride kept him from even seeing the destruction of Egypt. A servant had to tell him that. And, and Pharaoh didn't want anything to do with God in his life. Think about it, guys. We, we are all prideful, right? 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 We, we all have pride. It, it's in all of us. Uh, we all need to um, continue daily to, to come before the cross, come before the Lord. we got to die to ourselves. And if we don't catch that, uh, we too, if we're in pride, pride blinds you. Uh, from what the, the Lord wants to show you. And sometimes you might think, I'm doing pretty good. That might be an indicator of pride. <laughs> Lord, I don't have anything to bring to you. I mean, I'm pretty good. This is great. Um, once you keep praying, and just like David, Lord, you know, um, see if there be any wicked way within my heart. Um, immediately there's something that just shows up and it's like, oh no. <laughs> like, I'm wicked. I'm not good. So, uh, the question is, you know, are you willing to even recognize it? Are you willing to recognize that you have pride in your heart? Pharaoh didn't want to recognize that. Secondly, are you are you willing to get rid of it? Are you willing to just say, Lord, I, I hand this over to you? Because pride keeps that sin. It keeps, it says, I can control this. I got this. You guys remember with Eve there in the garden, that was the same attitude, that attitude of, I got this, right? I can handle this. I know what God said, but I got this. I want to explore. I want more, right? But what if God only has you for this much? He doesn't want you for this much or that much or that much. You're not going to impress God with that much. You're going to impress God with his will. And that's why we're to pray as servants for God's will to be done, not our will to be done, right? It's a good reminder when we pray and, and tell the Lord that um, it puts our hearts in check almost. But let's come to the third thing here, is the Passover that was given in Egypt. The Passover that was given in Egypt. Look at verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. This is going to be in verse 1 through 30. Um, in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt 
saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this first month uh, of the months is in what we know uh, the month of Nisan. Uh, it begins the first month of the Jewish sacred calendar, if you will. But they, the Jews had uh, two calendars. Um, this is their religious calendar. So, But it, it's the seventh month of the Jewish civil calendar, uh, which is their second calendar. So realize this is the beginnings of their months. And it begins a new life as it pertains to really breaking the bonds of slavery. Uh, they, they were in slavery for 430 years, and now this first day of the first month ushers in what we call the, um, the Feast of uh, Passover, and we're going to talk about that right now. But we, we used to be in bondage uh, as well as the church. We, we used to be in bondage to slave. It was... Um, it was in charge of our lives, and now we're free from the bondage of sin. It no longer has power and authority over our lives. We can say no. <laughs> we have the right to. So the moment we gave our lives to the Lord, we became freed um, from this, you know, slavery that we were in. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, um, he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. In fact, later down in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but grace. Uh, 2 Corinthians five seventeen says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Um, let's go back to our text. Look at verse 3. It says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, so it can't just be any lamb, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So it has to be a specific lamb um, and uh, can't be with spot. And it has to be at a specific time. Um, and, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lentil of the houses where they eat. Uh, where they eat it. So on the tenth of Nisan, they were they were to pick up a lamb. This lamb was to be without blemish. In other words, it was to be perfect. And on the fourteenth day of Nisan, they were to take a sacrificial lamb um, and slay it. And they they were to take the blood of the lamb, paint it on you know the doorpost of you know their their entry door, and, and in spreading the blood of the lamb, it would keep the inhabitants really of the land. Uh, safe uh, from the death angel, this destroyer, if you will, that, that's going to come in and, and, and kill all the firstborn. So um, what a picture that is of, of, of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? We're, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, uh, it says, Knowing that you are, were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but, and here's, here's the answer, um, actually a, a few days ago somebody told me on Facebook, they're like, how, where in scripture does it say that we're, you're saved, you know, because of the blood of Jesus? It doesn't say that anywhere. And I was like, what? <laughs> My brain was looking for scripture, it's like, oh, overboard, oh, it hurts. There's so much scripture. Uh, but here's another one, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. What does it say in verse 18? Knowing you were not redeemed 
So you are redeemed in verse 19 by what? The precious blood of Jesus. Isn't that cool? By the lamb. So this whole Passover uh, feast looks forward really to the Messiah and, and pointing to and speaking of the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, he says, for indeed Christ is our Passover who was sacrificed for us. Um, now let's keep going here in verse 8. It says, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire. So a nice barbecue. That's, I can smell it. Or, uh, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at uh, all with water, but roasted in fire. Its head with its legs and its entrails, you shall eat. Let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste, and it, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on the, that night, and uh, will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when you, I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plagues shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So it, it was the blood of the Lamb <clears throat> that caused this destroyer, if you will, uh, to pass over uh, that household, that the family. Interesting that for both the Jew and the Gentile, this blood uh, could be applied. The blood of the Lamb covered both the Jew and the judge, uh, the Gentile, from the judgment of God uh, that was coming upon them. Unlike all the other plagues, it was just on the Gentile, the Egyptians, right? Um, so I love that picture. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, and according to the law, well, at, well, at the end there, it says, because, you uh, know, uh, I'll just read the whole thing. Almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Why? Because in Leviticus, it says that the life is in the blood. Um, and, and But we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Um, I was going to get into a whole thing with you guys and share... I think I had like 20 scriptures verses to back it all up of why it had to be specifically a lamb and you know not any other animal it couldn't be uh, a bull um, or anything like that so very interesting you guys could do your own research on that but in the old covenant the blood of the bull and the goat uh, was simply a covering uh, for sin uh, and in the, in the Hebrew word it's kofar so a covering in other words we would say a hat right um, and, but in the, in the New Testament our sins they're not covered our sins are completely wiped away right they're completely taken away how it's by the blood of the lamb uh, in first John chapter 1 verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from how much sin all sin I love that if we say that we have no sin we, re we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what can take away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Like that? Should we just... We just sing the song. <laughs> yeah. Nothing but the blood of... All right. Um, let's keep going. Verse 15, it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day 
that person shall be cut off from Israel. Wow. And on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No matter of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this would be the... <clears throat> This would be the, um, uh, it says, for the, the same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. So this would be the next day after Passover, because remember, the Passover lamb was killed at twilight, so they're, they're brought out on the next day, and that's why the Feast of Unleavened Bread, by the way, uh, happens the day after Passover. And so it says, therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations, as an everlasting ordinance. So verse 18, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. So this, of course, is when the Passover lamb was slain. Um, <clears throat> part of the Passover involves eating unleavened bread. Uh, look at verse 19. It says, for seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leaven, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger, stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leaven. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, this is the second of the seven major feasts of Israel. I've got a, a PowerPoint slide for you. Uh, the first is Passover, then there's unleavened bread, and then there's the first fruits. There's Pentecost, which is what we're talking about, the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and uh, the, uh, the tabernacles. And so we looked at the Passover, you know, it's about, um, it was on the 14th day of Nisan, and this is when the, the Passover uh, celebration began. The next day is on the 15th through the 21st, of Nisan is the the feast of unleavened bread, and these two feasts they go hand in hand. They they go together um, uh, all the time. So uh, in the New Testament too, I think it says uh, uh, referring to I think it's the unleavened bread referred to as the Passover. They're they're both you know one and the same if you will, but they're both separate feasts, but they go together. Um, the third feast. Uh, is the Feast of First Fruits in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 11. It happens on the first Sabbath after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so all three feasts happen uh, within this first month of Nisan. And so this Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's so important since the leaven uh, is uh, in the Bible a type, a picture, if you will, of sin. And so unleavened bread is something we would say um, is without sin. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 6, uh, verse 48, he says, I am uh, the bread of life. And, and so the, even the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it, it points to Jesus Christ, which is interesting. Uh, why? Since in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, for he made him who knew no sin. He was perfect. He was without spot, right? He was without sin. In 1 John 3, 5, it says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. He is perfect. He is spotless. In 1 Peter 1, 18, again, at the end, or actually in verse 19, it says, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so even though that is true of Jesus Christ being this type, it's also true as it pertains to you and I as the church, you and I are to be blameless, above reproach. Uh, and and uh, so Paul, I think of him when he's speaking to the church in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, um, he says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Um, and so as the church, um, can also be a type, if you will, um, of this unleavened bread, because we're under the authority, if you will. We're, we're one, you know, and think of a marriage, right, with the husband and wife. They're one, right? We, as the bride, uh, you know, we're, we're one with Christ in that sense. So, interesting. The Bible talks a lot about purging, by the way, 
of, of leaven. So purging away of sin. And I'm just going to give it to you guys really quick here. We're, we're to purge out the leaven of malice and wickedness in 1 Corinthians 5 8. We're to purge the leaven of hypocrisy in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. We're to purge the leaven of false doctrine. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. We're to purge the leaven of Herod, uh, which is speaking of um, pride and, and really the world, in Mark chapter 8, verse 15. And we're to purge out the leaven of the Sadducees, which would be uh, unbelief uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6. So all of these are types, if you will, of sin, of leaven, if you will. Uh, so here's the problem we face. Uh, we think that we, we think that we can, uh, you know, the, the, the little bit of sin that we do, it's not bad, right? Am I alone here? Is that what you guys think the same way? I mean, uh, if somebody came and said, hey, let's go rob this bank and we're gonna shoot a bunch of people, it's like, no, -uh, I'm not gonna go with you, <laughs> right? But what if somebody says, hey, uh, that's still that lollipop right there. No, it doesn't matter. No, it's a lollipop, right? That, that's not nothing much, right? It's like, oh yeah, well, it's a little thing. Okay, I'll do it. Remember, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, uh, so a little compromise in sin, it's gonna swallow you up. It's gonna, it's gonna devour you. All sin leads to death, right? Um, so we need to be very cautious with that. Um, <clears throat> just because we think it might not hurt anybody, but it does. Leaven expands, by the way. Um, very interesting how that all works. But anyways, let's go to verse 21. It says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the, the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. In other words, even though you did everything, a perfect spotless lamb, you got the blood on the doorpost, but you decided you're just gonna go take a breath of fresh air. You're being disobedient, therefore you would drop dead. <laughs> right? So you had, everything was specific here. So it's not enough for the lamb to be slain, um, the blood was su was sufficient, right? Uh, and not uh, efficient unless it was applied. So interesting that um, only the head of the family, by the way, could do this. And there's a lot with that alone. Uh, you guys can look that up. Look, look at verse 23. It says, For the Lord will pass through and to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood of the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. You'll come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised that you shall keep this service, and it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? <clears throat> that you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped, and the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And so they did. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord had struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. Uh, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, <clears throat> he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Wow. So the tenth final plague here, uh, from the very wealthiest, highest authority position to the very lowest position, uh, God poured out his wrath, on those who rejected him. Um, there is no partiality in Christ Jesus, right? Sin, all sin, leads to death. And those who embrace sin, that's what happened here. Uh, look at, let's come to the fourth thing, and we'll, we'll finish up with this. It involves the people that fled from Egypt. The people that fled from Egypt. Look at verses 31 to 35. It says in verse 31, 
Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. So Pharaoh's pride was was broken at this point, if you will, uh, but not enough. Well, ten plagues, uh, including his firstborn, but he says, bless me. And so he's, he's still thinking about himself here, which is interesting. Um, look at verse 33. It says, And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We shall all be dead. And so the people took their dough before it was eleven, having their kneaded bowls bound up in their clothes uh, on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. So Ramses, uh, they're a city in uh, Egypt. Um, means child of the sun, and Succoth means booths. So this is not a city, they're, they're in a, the Jordan area uh, near Moab, and uh, so no doubt this speaks of the encampment, if you will, uh, that they made. And so look at verse 38, it says, A mixed multitude went up with them also, and the flocks and the herds, a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes and dough which they had brought, out of, the, out of Egypt, for it was not leaven, uh, because they were driven out of Egypt, they could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. So uh, 600,000 men, not including children, not including uh, the wives and, and the other women. So in numbers, uh, there, there's an indication that these 600,000 Men are, are, you know, all over the age of 20. Uh, so that's where the numbers started at the age of 20 and up. Uh, speaking of those that go to war, uh, which means there's a number, you know, under the age of 20. Uh, and so a lot of people do the math and they come up with the conclusion that this is about 2 million people coming out of Egypt. That's a, a nation in and of itself, right? Um, or a huge city. Um, look at verse 40. <clears throat> now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. So this is exactly what Paul talks about um, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, but look at verse 41. It says, And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on the very same day, so just like God said it would be, right? Uh, it, it came to pass that... Uh, all these armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Who's the armies of the Lord? Speaking of the, the, these slaves, they're slaves. Isn't that interesting? God calls them an army. It's so cool. Look at verse 42. And, it, and at night, a solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is an ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. Uh, a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the, uh, of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break um, <clears throat> one of its bones. All of the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the, the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, and so they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. So just as God had promised, he brought them out of captivity. And so to celebrate this event um, the, of the Passover, 
uh, and they would eat. And so the Passover was reserved exclusively for the children of Israel. And if someone wanted to partake of the Passover, um, they needed to be like the children of Israel uh, and, and as far as being circumcised, right? You want to hang out with us? You got to get circumcised. So what a picture that is for you and I. Um, you know, we, we've been grafted in as the church, right, as the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 11, verse 17, we've been circumcised in heart as the church, and now we can take part in the Passover. It's not, it's not the food, but Christ, right? He is our Passover, and you and I have the pri privilege, really, if you think about it, just like in Ephesians, it says that he is our peace, well, he's also our Passover. In other words, every day we can take part in this event. We don't need to wait once a year. Every day we can celebrate Jesus, right? Since he is our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Isn't that amazing? Um, I love it. So I love how the word speaks for itself. And that's, that's, uh, I'll leave it at that. So let's go ahead and pray, guys. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, so much <clears throat> for the time that we have. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to our hearts and minister to us, Lord, as we um, get rest tonight. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, continue to just uh, keep us, Lord, keep our hearts steady on your word, uh, Lord, that we would continue to draw near to you, Father, personally, um, Lord, that we wouldn't depend upon our spouse or our family members, Lord, who, who live for you, uh, Lord, that we would choose to live for you, that we would follow you, and that we would spend that time in, with you, Lord, and just thank you, Father, that you have you have redeemed us, Lord, from this world and the flesh and the, the enemy, Lord. You have purchased us, Lord. We no longer uh, are a part of uh, in bondage as a slave, Lord. We're, we're now a friend to you. You're the Lord God Almighty, and uh, what a privilege that truly is. Thank you, Lord, uh, for all that you've done for us. Thank you uh, that you continue to do a work in us, continue to Keep us content, Lord, with the things that we have and the, the places we go, the people we're with. Lord, I pray you would continue to minister to our hearts, and uh, may we be truly thankful uh, in all things, Lord. I pray for your grace uh, just to be poured out in our hearts, Lord, and that we would just be uh, free in you, just knowing that you're the Lord, Lord, and we're yours. And so, Thank you, Lord. I pray if this week that we're going to be with you, Lord, what an awesome time it's going to be. Uh, but until then, may we occupy, may we be faithful, may we store up, Lord, and may we uh, just continue to minister to, to those around us, Lord, uh, sharing the gospel. And uh, we love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.